This episode of MMPQB is brought to you by Susan Barnett, licensed associate broker with Keller Williams Upstate Country Properties at 31 Main Street, Oneonta, New York. She's a member of the Otsego, Delaware Board of Realtors, as well as the NYS Multiple Listing Service. You can find her online at upstatecountryrealty.com. Good advice, great service. It's better upstate. Find the show on Instagram at music.podcast. Email me any questions, comments, concerns, requests. Reach out to you. Bother them until they come on my show. More music podcast at gmail.com. Of course, the website musicpodcast.com. You can follow us on Facebook as well. Enjoy this week's episode. It's really, really exciting and fun to get to talk to you. Delightful to be On the line with me tonight, this is really exciting, one of my very favorite artists, Mr. Adam Wiener from Low Cut Connie. The new album, Private Lives, is out now, and of course you can see it at the Tough Cookies live stream every Saturday at 6, or if you're on Patreon, also every Thursday at 6. Did I get those details right? And welcome to the show, Adam. You did. Thank you, <laughs> MK. You, uh, listen, I miss chatting with you. You are the, the musical queen of the Hudson Valley. Thank you That's so much. You... Oh my goodness. I have uh, So it's I've good never... to connect and uh, be able to speak to you and say fuck and whatever. <laughs> yeah, this time. time finally we can say fuck in this conversation and I hope to say it a lot. Um yeah, thank you for the compliment. I've never been called the musical queen of the Hudson Valley before, but now I'm going to introduce myself that way at the top of every podcast episode. Wait, 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 wait. Let me do it. Okay. Boys and girls you are listening right now to my good pal, MK, the musical queen of the Hudson Valley, and you're listening to her because you got good taste. Fuck and yeah. I'm happy to be here. This is Adam Lowcut Connie. Let's roll. Woo! <laughs> Hell yeah. So how you been, dude? I mean, besides the obvious, you know, the quarantine and all of that, um, how are you personally doing? How are you holding up? Thank you for asking. I'm doing okay. You know, it's been a challenging year for everybody, but I'm lucky. I'm healthy. My loved ones are healthy. That's the most important thing, knock on wood. And uh, I'm working. And it's been a challenging time, but being able to perform twice a week uh, throughout this whole process has really kept me going. And uh, I didn't expect this thing to be my job where I just roll around in my underwear in my house <laughs> twice a week with a cell phone. But if that's what it takes to entertain people, to elevate their spirits and to keep some sort of live entertainment going in this industry, that's what I'll do. Yeah, and I have to give you a ton of credit because you were an early adopter of the live stream. You know, I uh, I was following you guys on social media, obviously, and pretty much as soon as we went into lockdown and it started to become obvious that there weren't going to be live shows for a while, you were one of the first people, you know, in your living room, on your piano, doing shows, and then you kind of like... You know, you got better and better with the technology and there started to be, you know, possibilities for more band members to show up and it turned into this, you know, weekly tough cookies thing. So, uh, yeah, props for jumping on that early. And uh, what was that? Yeah. Can you just kind of walk me through what that was like? Because I'm sure in the beginning it was like, oh, maybe we'll do, you know, three or four shows. And now it's something you've been doing all year. Yeah, I thought I would do three. I thought I would do three shows. It was March the 19th. And you know what's quaint about the whole thing is we were about 10 days into lockdown and people were like, I can't take this shit no more. Yeah. And, and they were like losing their minds. Like it was the worst thing that ever happened, but here we are nine months later and it's like, we're still locked down. We're still quarantining. And it's like, we don't, you know, it, it speaks to like, people don't know how strong they are, you know? Yeah. Um, but at the time, uh, it was this real, you know, not that we're in an easy moment now, but it was an especially terrifying moment that first week because it was like, what's going to happen? And 
um, are the people I know going to be okay? Um, you know, are we all going to get ill? And what's going to happen to my job? And, you know, it was, it was terrifying. And so after a week of just laying around, I was like, I got to do something, you know? Mm -hmm. So we just turned the cell phones on and went live Facebook and Instagram. And we didn't have a set list. We didn't have a plan. I just played what I felt and there's no applause or laughter and, I would say, boys and girls, say yes. And people would type, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and when it was done, the hour, I did an hour, I was almost naked <laughs> and completely covered in sweat. And I said, did anybody tune in? And they said, we had thousands of people. <laughs> like, there was people in all different languages. And... So then the second show, I said, where are you? Everybody type where you are. And we had 125,000 viewers the second show. And MK, like the, the responses, we had people in Japan, Afghanistan, Lebanon, Oslo, Man. Johannesburg, Tokyo. You know, it was like crazy. And that's when I realized that this live streaming thing was like, there's something to it. Mm -hmm. You know, like... It, if I could figure out how to make people feel like they're part of, like they're watching this live performance with other people, you know, make them feel like they're part of this, 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 this moment. And it's not just this sort of cold technological broadcast, you know? Yeah. If I could get them sort of interactive with the commenting with the emojis, with photo, with video, by responding to them, you know, in, in real time, then I could give people a sense of, of relief or, or like release of their emotions because suddenly MK, like you, you realize all of a sudden what the value of live entertainment is when you don't have it. Yeah. You know, and, and be replicated by, uh, you know, pre-recorded entertainment. What it is about being live in an unpredictable living moment with other people sharing it, you know? And so it took me a minute to figure out how to do it, considering I can't hear applause or see anybody or mess up anybody's hair. But once I figured out a format that would support that, which was a sort of variety show. Um, it just kind of took off and it's been a very therapeutic for a lot of people, including myself. It has been for you because that's kind of, you know, what I wonder, like when you're doing a live performance for an audience that's in the room, you're feeding off of that energy and it must be harder to keep that energy up because, I mean, you know, your show is so dynamic and so, you know, costs so much energy for you, I'm sure. Like, you know, is it harder when you can't see the people or, you know, like, are you just like, have you kind of adjusted in quarantine to like knowing that they're there via seeing their names pop up on the screen? I can feel them. I can feel them. I can't see them, but I can feel them with me. Yeah. Like I have an antenna. It's like I have an antenna on the back of my head. And I know that there are hundreds and sometimes thousands of people watching all over the country and all over the world. And you know what the unique thing about this time is that we're all experiencing a lot of things together. Like everybody's kind of in the same boat with a lot of things, not just in the country, but in the world, like everybody is dealing with quarantine. Mm -hmm. Everybody is dealing with the terror of this moment and this major, uh, hopefully once in a lifetime global health crisis. And we all have experienced grief and lost jobs and uncertainty and isolation. Everybody in the world is experiencing these things. And so there is a this sort of group think and shared aspect to it um, that helps, it helps. 
to get people to relate to each other um, when they're kind of, you just have to point out to people that we're already kind of on the same page and in the same boat. And so I just kind of see myself as a host and a, and a facilitator. Um, it's not a concert. I'm not doing a concert. I'm hosting kind of like a, a performance art forum for people where they can interact with each other and with me in, in an effort to raise their spirits through art, you know, and I will use anything. I will throw the kitchen sink at people. I'll comedy, music, stripping, <laughs> I'll do horoscope, uh, you know, whatever it takes to just not distract people, but give them a sense of release from what they're feeling, if that makes sense. Yeah, it totally makes sense. You know, and I'm kind of, I'm, I'm wondering, I want to go back to the antenna in the back of your head comment because, you know, there's this sense of like the internet being this very powerful thing that, you know, helps us kind of like feel this connection that already exists. And I'm wondering, you know, quarantine, I've, I've had a lot of downtime myself and I've had a lot of time to kind of get back into things that I'd sort of forgotten I was into. And one of those things is like, you know, philosophy and like reading up on like metaphysical concepts. And lately I've been thinking more and more about the concept that like really you know, all living things are basically just one organism, like a giant mushroom, you know, like a, like a fungus that's, that's just got little points popping up all over the place, but really it's just one big thing. And like thinking of not just humanity, but everything in that, in that way. And, you know, when you kind of talked about that, it was like, oh yeah, like you, you are connected and you are feeling that energy. And, and, you know, do you, do you think of it in those terms? Is that something that you're into? I do. Um, you know, maybe not in as beautifully explicit in, as, as you have, <laughs> but just sort of instinctually what I try to do, whether I'm live in person or live on camera, is I'm trying to download the feeling in the room. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get take the temperature of where people are at and then give them back something that they need and want, whether they know they need or want it. And so sometimes the tenor in the room is humor, like just something, just craziness and people just need to laugh. But sometimes people need to cry. Like, for, like you know, we started out with the show, you know, much more wild and humorous as the main sort of tenor of the show. But then as pe more and more people struggled and more and more people passed away, I had to navigate how to play to different moments, whether that was doing a tribute to a great artist that passed, like early in the quarantine, Bill Withers or John Prine, doing those tributes, or, you know, when George Floyd was murdered, uh, shortly, you know, that, that, that news was breaking as we were preparing to do that broadcast that night. And I just threw out everything I was thinking of doing and had to do something different because the moment called for it. Yeah. And that was challenging because I was using comedy as my main tool. And it was not a night for comedy. And I had to find another way to do a show, and I was—I I haven't been so nervous in a long time. But we did a risky show that night, and just went for it, and spoke directly to what was going on in the country. Like, didn't want to distract from it; just wanted to dive headlong into it. Yeah. And people really responded to that, and it gave me a sense that the audience was understanding this dynamic relationship that we have that I'm I'm feeling what they're feeling and I'm going to try and uh, put it out there and let's air it out when 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 Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away I did Kaddish that night mm -hmm. uh, live on camera which was which was um, you know it's the mourners prayer in Judaism and I was feeling sad and I wanted people to see what in my tradition that I grew up with, how we would deal with grief and honoring somebody. Right. Yeah. And so the show is just 
developed into this much more dynamic thing where I'm just trying to give people what they need um, at, in all situations. And it's my job to tune my antenna to what's going on in the world and what's going on in their lives. Yeah, you've really had to uh, level up psychically, <laughs> it sounds like. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, don't we all? Um, you know, I'm not a tune out kind of guy. I'm a let's get activated type. And I want my viewers and my listeners to feel like they're part of a solution and, and maybe a healing process, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You, the worst thing you can feel is helpless. So whether it's supporting our healthcare workers, as uh, we have a lot of them that watch the show, like people actually, there are nurses that watch the show that broadcast it every Saturday in the hospitals, oh, awesome. in the ICU. Yeah, that's great. Uh, we have old age homes where they do watch parties. We have families that haven't seen each other in 10 months and they do watch parties. Like, wh wh whatever it is, um, you know, like, I have to find a way. Uh, and all together, we have to find a way to make a magic moment together and have a Saturday night together. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, you've been very, very good at that. And thanks for doing that. And uh, I'm sure it's been exhausting at times but it's also been like yeah it's been amazing to have this thing every week that it's like all right well i know low cut connie's doing a thing tonight so you know even if i miss going out to the clubs even if i miss you know seeing shows in person like i know i can watch this and you know feel like i'm in an audience well thank you at the risk of being annoying it's just <laughs> i it's given me purpose it's given me a job because i'm not on tour and i can't go out there uh, to radio stations and p p promote the album. And I, I, you know, I'm at home just like everybody's at home. So it gives me a project. I've covered over 600 songs since March. So it's been an amazing musical experience for me and for Will, the guitar player that I work with so closely on the show. We have expanded, <laughs> uh, like our horizons musically doing this show by playing music that I never thought I could play. Whether it's rock and roll, soul, hip hop, salsa music, country music, you know, I, I'll do Cardi B and Hank Williams and Marvin Gaye and Sylvester all in the same show. And I have to learn how to sing all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, which honestly, like, People who've never covered something, people who aren't singers, I'm, I'm a much more casual musician than you, but I do, you know, do a lot of covers in my casual music career. And, you know, you don't realize how much variance there is in style. You know, it's not even just about the range. A lot of it's just like, how do I sing this? I particularly enjoyed, uh, you did um, Video Games by Lana Del Rey, who I love. Yeah. And I never would have thought of that as a song for you, but it's a great song for you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I'm, I... It's been a time of just challenging myself. You know, when I say to somebody in my team or even just to myself, oh my God, I can't, do, I can't pull that off. That's the moment when I get fired up to, to try. You know, the other night we did It's Raining Men as our, like we do this thing called The Bridge Too Far where we play a song that they have to vote on whether we have gone too far, <laughs> you know? <laughs> And sometimes that's about, is this song a guilty pleasure? But sometimes it's like, has Adam, you know, gone to, is he tried to inhabit a piece of music that he can't, you know, whether it's Technotronics, Pump Up the Jam or, that, or, that's a tough or one. It's Raining Men. Yeah. And it's like, did I pull it off? And um, I'm just trying to be the Meryl Streep of rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> and be, show people I could do anything. Yeah, well, I mean, when you get back out on the road, eventually, like, you're going to bring all these new skills. It's going to be a crazy new show. I have no idea but it, what it's going to be. Um, but I'm excited because I've become so addicted now to doing these shows without a script, you know, yeah. just totally in the moment. And um, 
I cannot wait to carry that into the live in venue live performance you know oh, yeah yeah just go in without a set list and play what you what you feel i love it it's a whole other muscle group though it's very it's very uh intimidating but you just kind of gotta like go for it it's really scary <laughs> and i actually do have some experience with that because one of my one of my main bands when you know bands are happening is uh it's we're called cold flavor repair and we mostly do covers we've got some originals too and we're like we're like your average bar party band although I say average. Um, I don't mean average. We're above average. We're really, really good. Um, <laughs> the guys I play with are incredible players. We've got, you know, dope keyboardists, guitar, drums, bass. Um, everybody's awesome. We have a horn section that comes up from the city sometimes. It's a really solid band. And uh, a lot of the time when we play at our favorite bar, Snugs in New Pulse, uh, we just know that the crowd will love whatever we do. So we go in with pretty much no set list. We'll have like a loose discussion beforehand and then just kind of like feel it out. And sometimes there are long, awkward moments in the middle between songs where we're all arguing over what we want to play next. But sometimes there's just this natural flow where someone will be like, hey, this would sound good into this. And we'll all just go there together. And it's beautiful. <sighs> Yeah, it's it's not what I'm used to, um, but now I'm I'm becoming addicted to it. Yeah, like I said, we've done six hundred, over six hundred songs, and they're all I should mention they're all archived on Patreon. Uh, dot com slash Connie for our members who want to go back and watch all sixty five hours. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> um, or all of the interviews that I've done. Um, which has been, I think I've interviewed about 30 people so far yeah. on the show. Yeah, that's right. I meant to ask you about that. Were, had you ever interviewed before or only been interviewed? The only interviewing that I'd ever done was when I partnered um, with all these radio stations, including your previous radio station on my show called The Connie Club. Mm -hmm. Um, I did this four episode season of a radio show that's on our website and uh, I did interview Big Frida and Kate O'Reardon from the Pogues and Caroline Rose and a few people. That was my first time switching to the other side of the microphone, but as you've acknowledged, I've been interviewed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. Sure. And... Um, so that gives you a little bit of an idea how to navigate it. Um, so I have interviewed um, a lot of Rock and Roll Hall of Famers. Dion, Darlene Love, Nils Lofgren, uh, Chuck Prophet, Big Frida, Tank and the Bangas. Uh, it's just been incredible. Um, and we have a lot of amazing guests coming up. I just did a uh, Joan Osborne. I interviewed um, Colin Hay from Men at Work. Oh, I love him. And uh, it's a different skill set, as you know. Yeah, yeah. Are you a an over preparer or an under preparer, or where do you where do you land? I typically under prepare and then regret it. I'm learning. <laughs> I'm learning. Um, a little bit of both, you know, like it's exciting when I get to interview somebody like Dion, who's 80 years old and is, you know, a living legend or, or Darlene Love is 79 and, and I know their careers really well Yeah. and I can sort of roll and I feel like artists like that, they don't always get the deep dive music, musician to musician, um, conversation, but then I interviewed uh, Beyonce's father, Matthew Knowles. Oh, yeah. And that, you know, I didn't know much about his life and his career. Uh, he managed Destiny's Child to great success and Beyonce and Solange for many years. And that one, I really had to prepare for. And um, that, was, that was a fun interview when it was over. I was like, wow, we, we did it. <laughs> but, <laughs> Really, really, I knew we were really going to talk shop about the music business. Another one I did that I loved was um, Jake Shears from the Scissor Sisters, who is a friend of mine, but I didn't know a ton about his career. And I, so I did a lot of research there. Um, but you know what? My favorite interview of all of, of all of them was Bobby Rush, who's an 86, he actually just turned 87, blues artist 
legendary blues artist. They call him the king of the Chitlin circuit. Hmm. And um, he has been performing since he's a teenager in Mississippi. And he is, uh, he recently won his first Grammy, but uh, he has experienced so many different eras of the music business from the 1940s to now. And most importantly, has experienced so much racism mm. in Mississippi and then in Chicago in the 50s, uh, in touring the segregated Jim Crow South. And we just had this incredible conversation of how the music industry has changed during his lifetime. Yeah. Yeah. He's pretty much seen all of it. That's amazing. Yeah. 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 You know, I do. I love that about interviewing people that you never quite know where it's going to go. And that's very much my philosophy on this show where like, I, I don't want it to just be about like, okay, and how did you get your start in music and what happened next? And let's talk about, you know, like that's, that's great for radio, you know, for a quick 15 minute overview, but for an hour long podcast, like I want to, I want to ramble a little bit more. And that really leads to some interesting stuff. And, you know, there's been days of course, without naming any names and, and it's never about like not wanting to talk to a person, but there's been days where I'm like, oh man, I just don't really feel like, you know, having a conversation today necessarily. And then I'll, I'll, you know, do it anyway and I'll end up having a blast and I'll end up having, you know, what I'll walk away feeling like is one of my best interviews ever. And you just, you never know. And you never know like who that's going to happen with or what you're going to end up talking about. And uh, yeah, I, I do really love that about interviewing and the podcast format too, because it's so much more free form than radio. And, you know, I can say fuck. I love this podcast because I can say, fuck <laughs> this, fuck that. And, you know, I'm from New Jersey, so, like, I have problems censoring myself. And half the time, I've got to really be a good boy. If I'm talking to NPR, like, I'm on Morning Edition uh, the week of Christmas, and I'm going to have to mentally prepare that whole day. Uh-huh not say something bad you know what i mean <laughs> i mean you think so but i'm sure you know like in the moment you always end up like remembering where you are you know it reminds me when i used to work at girl scout camp i was a counselor and we couldn't swear in front of the kids or obviously say any anything too raunchy in front of the kids and you know during counselors week the week before when we were all training we were like oh god this is gonna be so hard we're all such you know filthy animals how are we gonna remember to behave ourselves in front of these children and then the kids show up and you just you code switch you know like you just go into this different mode and you know it's it's not so bad but it, it is nice to you be know, able to let my hair it down sounds here. Like it's easier for you than for me though because you know when i do tough cookies twice a week i start to show off and i say mazel tov motherfuckers you made it through <laughs> another week and you know people learn a lot of new words when they listen to the show in fact we have a lot of parents that watch with their kids and i'm, I'm astounded because <laughs> <laughs> They're going to see and hear things they, that they've not been exposed to before. But so it's funny to me because um, it's been very freeing, actually, with live streaming. I can do whatever the hell I want. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's my show. <laughs> it's not like a music festival with rules or whatever. And it can be as short or as long and whatever. But. But then when I talk to the BBC or something, I got to, like, be a good boy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Have you had any complaints from parents or anybody being like, oh, I didn't know this was a not safe for work program? Um, I wouldn't say complaints, but we've had a number of people ask if we could start doing special just for kids tough cookies Oy. broadcast. Yeah. And that ain't going to happen. No, sorry. You know, like, like, no, because we have a lot of parents that watch with their kids and they love it mm -hmm. you know and even though i curse and clothes come off it's fundamentally is a family show yeah it's just uh a bit on the edge of what a family show could be uh so actually we have a lot of parents that love it it's just where where's the line you know so i i always try to just keep one toe on the right side of the line and I'm cool. Yeah. Well, I mean, your heart's in the right place and I'm sure cool parents know that. And it's a, it's a personal choice, family to family. Like, do you want to, you know, sit down with your kids and have a conversation and say, Hey, we're going to watch this rock and roll show, but just know that, you know, there are some words that you shouldn't repeat on your zoom school. Well, I'll tell you though, the public show that we do on Saturdays, as opposed to the private Patreon shows we do on Thursdays, 
you know, like with the private member shows, it can be a little more out there because mm-hmm. um, it's not on Facebook or whatever. So, like, we did the electric slide last week. Huh. And um, I had read this article about how the electric slide was written by this guy in the 70s about a vibrator. Really? Yeah, like his, his ex-girlfriend said, I don't need you no more. I got my electric slide. <laughs> Oh my God. He wrote this electric boogie and it, you know, like 15 years later, it became a hit and huge hit. It's actually the biggest female um, reggae song of all time. That is hilarious. It's Marsha Griffiths. And so he didn't want anybody to know that the song was really about a vibrator. (laughs) And. He, he waited 40 years to tell everybody because he, he, you know, he wanted his hit. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so we told everybody, but that was a private Patreon show. And it was kind of like, these are the kind of things that do come up. But to me, it's still educational. Yeah. Wow. I, I can't believe that. You just blew my mind. And now I'm thinking about like the lyrics and I'm like, oh yeah, it's totally about a vibrator. <laughs> you got to use it. It's electric. electric. <laughs> oogie, woogie, woogie. <laughs> it's chicken. Yeah. Yeah, that makes total sense. All right, it is the holiday season, and it's a super weird one for a lot of us, myself included, but uh, for anybody out there who is in the very fortunate position of being able to consider giving back, please consider helping out Jam for Tots in partnership with Toys for Tots and NYS Music. John Pinder and nysmusic.com have been working with local musicians and toysfortots.org for about 15 years at bringing local communities together to help struggling families during the holiday season. Statewide concerts and fundraising events help collect toys and donations for their local communities. Local musicians like John Pinder put the pieces together on the ground level for fun, productive evenings of live music, collaborations, and fundraising in the Hudson Valley, most recently at the Stewart House in Athens. All donations go to families in the counties of which each event is held. Since live music events are not happening right now, we are at our greatest disadvantage to collect toys while more families are in greater need than ever before. So online donations are desperately needed. Donation boxes are still located at select venues open for takeout and limited indoor dining like Crossroads Brewing Company in Athens, Hilltop in Tannersville, Putnam Place in Saratoga Springs, The Hollow in Albany, and Funkin' Waffles in Syracuse. However, the quickest and easiest way to donate is via toysfortots.org. Jam for Tots brings hundreds of people together each year, generating hundreds of dollars and hundreds of toys from cooperating venues across the entire state. This year, families are counting on online donations to fill that void. Go to toysfortots.org and donate. That money goes a long way for children and families. Not many people know this, but the Toys for Tots Foundation does a great deal for struggling families, including counseling, literacy programs, and so on. Please donate to toysfortots.org. Visit johnpinder.com for information on future Hudson Valley Jam sessions and local music. And check out nysmusic.com for statewide music and concert information. Most importantly, have a happy holiday and thanks for helping us spread the good word. I mean, um, talking about the private stream, I would also love to talk about private lives. How's that for a segue? Nice. Right? Um, so I've been listening to it a lot the last couple of days. I listened to it when it came out too, and then I've been revisiting it. And, uh, I, the, the word that keeps coming to mind as I listen to it is fury. I feel like there's a lot of fury behind that album. Am I, am I perceiving that just because it's a 2020 record or do you feel that way too? Fury, like F-U-R-Y? Yes. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, like a lot of artists um who put records out this year it's like i finished it just as quarantine was starting Mm -hmm. um but it it you know like if you write if you try to write truthful songs um whether they're humorous or dark or whatever it is but if you try and write from a position of truth then you're going to be tapping into something real and people are going to say you know it's like you just wrote about the times that we're living in, you know? So, like, you know, Bob Dylan would write, Everything is Broken. Like, that's a song he wrote in the 80s. But it could have been written yesterday, sure. you know? Yeah. And so, 
that sort of happened to me in that I wrote these songs over years and recorded them over years and they just took on a deeper resonance it seems like this year like private lives which has so much to do with isolation and and uh, subcultures uh and how people get by when they're completely isolated from each other you know uh that wasn't about quarantine but damn if it didn't feel like it was yeah it uh, my song help me which was a has been a pretty big radio single for us this year we actually are ending 2020 in the top 20 at public radio oh nice congrats for the first time but you know that that was a song i recorded two years ago and yet it feels very much related to what people are going through living in lockdown uh Fury, sure. I mean, I just bring a passion to whatever I do. Um, I don't really have a filter, you know. Um, I think that's why I've never been cool. Uh, I was never, I was, you know, never cool when I was in school. I was like the, the cross-eyed kid in the corner that got made fun of. And then musically, I've never been doing anything that was really on trend. We've always been sort of out of step uh, with what is cool at the moment. And that's part of it is, I think, because I do what I do with, with total sincerity and uh, passion. And uh, ironic distance is much cooler than, than passion, you know? Oh, absolutely. So I, I certainly, with Private Lives, just tried to be truthful and not really play to any kind of um, audience. Like I just tried to put out what I was feeling and, and what I would want to listen to. Yeah, well, sincerity makes people uncomfortable generally. So yeah, I guess uh, good on you for, for sticking with it and for being truthful, you know? And I was also, you know, the weird kid who got made fun of and now I consider myself much cooler than most people <laughs> without having changed very much. and. Uh, you know, I'm sure there's, myself included, lots of people out there who think you're extremely cool. So, you know, I think it, it circles around at some point when you just keep doing what you're doing and keep being yourself and, and you know, not, like you said, you know, you're not really in step with what everybody else is, is doing on trend. And eventually that makes you a trendsetter. I think you're right. Um, if, thank, I mean... If I'm cool today, I'll be uncool tomorrow. Mm -hmm. It's fun. It's it's so funny. Like I, people have used the word retro to talk about my music for so many years, and then all of a sudden this year with Private Lives, that word went away, hmm. and, and um, people are saying that it sounds like 2020. You know what? I'll put a new album out next year or the year after, and they'll say it sounds retro. Yeah. Uh, it, it's fine. Like it's it's. You know, I'm just kind of following that antenna on the back of my head. And I don't pay too much attention to, to what the trends are um, or what the sound of the moment is. And uh, that means that sometimes I'll be on the money and sometimes I won't. But I'm always going to just try and speak from the heart. Yeah, well, you absolutely do. And, and I have a soft spot in my heart for uh, Look What They Did on the album um you know that came out while i was still at radio and i was you know i, I gave it a few spins although it's it, there's too many fucks and shits in it and they wouldn't let me like yeah. continue to because we had an edit from your label but you know it just wasn't quite the same with the without the uh the fucks and shits in it so i i had already had an attachment to that song and then you know this is what tells me that there's something very truthful in that song the day after i lost my job i couldn't get it out of my head like that was just like that sad piano line was just like following me around all day Wow. That's wow. Well, listen, um, you know, I, I, I've never put a song out like Look What They Did before, but I felt so right about it. And I got so much support and so much backlash for it. I'll tell you why, because, um, you know, it, it's, it's explicit. I speak directly about Donald Trump. I speak directly about Atlantic City and what he did there. Yeah. 
and I grew up in in South Jersey, so I grew up seeing that. Um, the, it's not really a poetic song. It's just kind of like right down the middle of the pike. Yeah. You know, and um, so uh, what happened was it came out in February pre-quarantine. And it was kind of a news story a bit in this area. It got picked up by not music uh, magazines and press, but news organizations and politics, right? So the Atlantic City newspaper, the New Jersey, New Jersey.com, the Philadelphia Inquirer, they, they covered it like political news. Mm -hmm. And because they were posting it on these news sites, um the backlash was vicious really you know, which i'm fine with you know i'm not gonna lose sleep over that but the people that supported it and supported me for putting it out like i gained more than i lost but i definitely lost some people i'm i certainly i don't really care but um it was the first time that this quote-unquote party band low cut connie i put out this you know, right on the nose, socially conscious uh, piano ballad, right. solo piano ballad. And people didn't expect that from me. And so I was letting people know that this album was going to be much more from my heart, much more about truth than about party, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I always took it whenever somebody would take issue with something I said on the radio, you know, some some lefty thing that came out of my mouth or some song I played, like, look what they did. You know, every so often I would get somebody writing in who was all, you know, mad about that and, you know, just play the songs and you shouldn't be talking about politics. And, and yeah, like, my take was always like, well, you know, I don't really need you to listen to what I'm doing. Like, you, you know, you, you weren't my target audience. I kind of pride myself on and i think you'll see this at a low cut connie concert and you see this at the tough cookie streams as well i, I pride myself on having a diverse audience mm -hmm. and we have black and white gay and straight old and young right uh we have parents that bring their kids to our shows and then we have college kids that find us on spotify and they bring their parents mm -hmm. and that's very cool but part of it is is we actually have a fairly diverse audience to, to a certain degree in terms of politics. And I, it took me a while to figure that out. And what I've tried to do, and I've been inspired by Bruce Springsteen in this regard, because he has a diverse fan base, you know, po politically. Sure but he keeps everybody at the table. Like everybody knows that, that he and now I will stick my neck out for things that I feel and that are important. But I want to do so in a respectful way so that people stay at the table because I don't just want to preach to the choir. I do actually want to reach people that uh, might think differently than me. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in the wake of um, the George Floyd murder, when I started being much more explicit um, about my feelings about race in America and injustice on the live stream, we got a lot of messages from people, um, mostly very supportive, but some very angry, you know? Yeah. And we responded to every person and said, um, you know, you're still welcome in the tent. You don't have to agree with everything that I say, but I'm, I'm always going to say what I feel. And as long as you can maintain uh, respect for the people in the room, uh, which people generally have, uh, then you're welcome. We did lose some people. We actually kept some conservative people in the room uh, with Tough Cookies. And 
I don't know if I changed minds, but I do think we exposed some people to some things that they they, they weren't hearing otherwise in their curated news feed, you know? Yeah, and that is really important because, you know, the echo chamber is the biggest problem right now that we have people who, yeah, are only listening to Fox News, are only seeing, you know, the, the opinions of people who agree with them. And even just seeing somebody, you know, an artist or somebody that they that they like, whose work they enjoy, speaking, you know, an opinion that they don't agree with, but they can still see that person as a person and still like something that they're doing at least is like breaking through that uh, that echo chamber a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I have a diverse audience, but it is a majority white audience, right? Mm -hmm. um, I do have a lot of people of color that love Low Cut Kanye, and actually we get played on the R&B station here in Philadelphia. I'm very proud of the fact that we've done so much work with um, some of the radio stations, some of the music festivals and other acts here in Philadelphia to, to break up the segregation of the entertainment business here in the city, because yeah. there's so much. Like these clubs are for these people and these festivals are the, for these people and these radio stations are for these people. But to be fair, it is a majority white audience for me and so, in my interviews, I've, I've really tried to talk about race and injustice with people of color on my shows, whether it's with Beyonce's dad talking about the record label wanting to lighten Beyonce's skin in photographs, or Darlene Love talking about not being allowed to have her picture on the records in the 60s in the Phil Spector era. <laughs> or Bobby Rush, or Patty Jackson, or Tank, or Big Frida, all these people that I've spoken to about their experience. Something I can't, I will never experience. I want my audience to hear it and see it and have a real conversation about it. And it's been beautiful because um, I we get to see the forum of the thousands of comments of how people react to the conversations. Yeah, I think people are learning. I think people are learning. Like, I try to keep it entertaining and keep it popping, but I think they're learning some things. All right. We are back. We had a, a little moment of audio weirdness, but um, yeah, I just want to uh, jump back in to say, yes, having those conversations is really important and uh, and also difficult, you know, as, as a, a white person myself and an interviewer and somebody who tries to, you know, like not just talk to other white people, like it can be... You know, I'm trying really hard to toe the line between just being sensitive and, and being, you know, an ally and understanding that I don't really know what that means and just wanting to be just wanting to be open to being told what that means by somebody who knows better. I mean, have you kind of had that experience? Like, have you, you know, kind of spoken to people about like being an ally? Yeah. Honestly, it's this has been an amazing experience with this show because I don't when I do concerts, I don't get to interact with people, right? I don't in the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a concert. I, I do the performance. I try to move people and then I move on. But these tough cookie episodes with the, as a variety show, it's a conversation. It's a back and forth. It's interactive. And so there's more of a chance to, I always say, give me one hour of your time to change your frame of mind. That can mean a lot of things. And it certainly means I want to uplift your emotions, but also uh, maybe, maybe expand people's thinking about certain topics, mm -hmm. right? And I don't necessarily need to lecture people, give them my opinion on anything. I just need to give a forum to people, uh, expose them to people and points of view that they might not otherwise hear. And they can have their natural reaction to it. And it's been very positive because people, despite the uh, turmoil and the unbelievable um, dissension in, in, in our society, 
people do crave connection with each other. They want, whether they can acknowledge it or not, they want to have good feelings. You know, they want to have somebody facilitate connections between people that they, you know, otherwise don't. And that's part of my job. That's part of my job. And um, I'm going to continue to try to do that and try to keep a diverse audience if I can. Yeah. Yeah, that's such an important thing to remember. And and it's true. Like, we want to like each other. We want to get along. You know, I think of, like, I have a neighbor down the street who, you know, he's been, like, very nice and friendly since we moved into the neighborhood a couple years ago. And this year, he's got a lot of Trump signage up. And he's got, you know, signs that say things like, vote the Bible. And meanwhile, I'm over here with my Black Lives Matter and my Biden sign. So, you know, we haven't had a conversation about it, but we both know where each other's opinions are. And, you know, I was I was coming back to the house one day with my my dog, my younger dog, who's still kind of a cute little puppy. And, uh, you know, he, he saw us outside and waved and, you know, he clearly wanted to pet the puppy. So I was like, oh, you want to see it? You know, say hi, pet the puppy, whatever. And we had a nice chat and he petted the puppy. And, and you know, we talked about our Christmas decorations and it was like man, like, you're a nice guy. Like, we could, you know, we could find common ground there, you know, like, we could we could be good neighbors. And it's it's strange to me to know that, like, you support this person who is a racist, fascist, rapist, but, like, I, you know, at, at some point... <laughs> oh, I agree with you. <laughs> uh, and then you... But, but then you try and scan the horizon for where is there common ground. It's hard. But you know what it is? Art is is the thing. Yeah. And um, I always talk about some of the songs that I play. You know, back in the summer, at one point I played uh, Aretha Franklin, Respect. And I talked about the history of that song. But you know what I find fascinating about that song? Respect. So Respect comes out and it was the biggest hit song of that summer. Mm -hmm. And you know why that's important is because it was a hit everywhere. Like white people in the South, in segregated South, were listening to and buying Respect by Aretha Franklin. And they'd, in their bars and in their weddings and things, they're playing and singing Respect. You know why? Because it's just a catchy, great song that you can dance to, mm -hmm. you know? And whether people knew it or not, that changed the culture. Like, Aretha put the word respect into our culture, into our language in a new way. And it was such an undeniable hit song that people it was beyond politics it was beyond divisions it's just a great song that you can't deny that's art you know it's the power of art yeah and yet white segregationists in the south singing along to respect i think it did a lot uh maybe not in an immediate way but it, it did a lot to change the tenor and the language of the in the conversations about these issues you know? Yeah. And so I don't necessarily with my show or my songs go out of my way to give any kind of lecture or just give opinions. It's not my, it's not my calling. I'm, I'm an artist. I'm trying to make things that resonate with people on a more metaphysical and emotional level. Right. Mm -hmm. And, but you can, within that you can expand people's uh thinking about certain things and that's what i've tried to do this year yeah yeah respect is a great example because it's you know like you said it's such a great universal song and it's something that everybody can relate to everybody who hears those lyrics has been in a position where they felt like they should demand respect from somebody because they weren't getting enough you know and and whether the white people in the South, you know, in, in those, you know, KKK bars understood really what they were listening to or not, like they still connected to the words on their own level, which, you know, in some way has to be helping to bridge the divide at least a little bit. So yeah, it's, yeah, 
I, I agree with you <laughs> that art is art is a very important way to bridge that gap. And, and, you know, whether it's having a little conversation with your neighbor about your puppy and your Christmas lights or, you know, listening to music from somebody who is from a demographic that you don't think you understand, like it's it's still it's small steps. Think about think about somebody like Johnny Cash. Um, if I say to somebody, all right, in three seconds, answer the question was, was Johnny Cash liberal or conservative? One, two, three, go. Uh, you get, you get a lot of different answers. Mm. Johnny Cash was an artist and there's many who was claimed by both sides of the political spectrum. Um, at different times, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, his music was fairly truth telling. Um, he's certainly just kind of for the underdog, but a lot of people just related to his songs and, um, you could look at it through political lens, but that's really, his music is bigger than that. And you could say the same thing about Marvin Gaye or Aretha Franklin or James Brown or Prince or Bruce Springsteen or the Rolling Stones. It's like, it's bigger than politics, you know? Yeah. And uh, it is, you know, a fundamental life force that, that brings us all together as human beings on this planet, music and art. Yeah, absolutely. That's, uh, that's pretty much what it comes down to is, you know, and one thing that I've thought about a lot this year is that music is this thing that we really cannot live without. And even in, you know, this situation this summer, this year where we can't go and see it the way we want to, like, we still are all finding ways to make it, to see it, to listen to it, to appreciate it. And, um, yeah, I, I think... I, I don't want to sound super woo and say, like, music is the thing that's going to heal this country, but, like, it's going to help. It's part of it. Yeah. It's part of it. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think um, also my last two cents on the topic, we're so consumed by politics, and rightly so, rightly so, because we need to stay tuned in, you know, mm -hmm. but we're so concerned by politics in the news that art doesn't always drive the culture you know yeah but we do well in our societies when art does drive help drive the culture do you know mm -hmm. and um i hope that that we're moving towards that again I hope yeah i do too um, and that pretty much brings us to the end of our hour and, and I think is a good and hopeful note to, to land on. So, Adam, thank you again. This has been just delightful. And um, tell us again where we can find all the stuff. Yeah, it was my pleasure, really. And anytime, like, let's do this again and keep up the great work. And uh, we want to hear you on the airwaves, whether it's the radio or a podcast or, or singing in a bar. <laughs> keep it up. Um, for those of, that are listening, lowcutconnie.com uh, is like a portal, and you can get private lives through there, the new record, um, and you can tune in through there. Every Saturday at 6 o'clock Eastern, we broadcast a free show on Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, and YouTube. And then on Thursdays at 6 Eastern, we do private member uh, streams at uh, patreon.com slash lowcutconnie. Everyone is welcome. It's a big tent. We have people from many countries, and it's a beautiful, weird, funky, crazy group of people. The comments are crazy. The shows are a little nuts. Um, join in. Maybe your spirits will be lifted. Give it a shot. And bring the kids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Adam. I'll talk to you next time. I'll talk to you soon. Mwah. Mwah. Thanks for listening to More Music Please Quarantine Beat. Follow the show on Instagram at moremusic.podcast and check out the website moremusicpodcast.com for new episodes. Questions or comments, email moremusic.podcast at gmail.com. Thanks to DJ Scully, Michael Kadnar, and James Stewart for the catchy theme song you're hearing now. 
I'm MK Burnell. Talk to you next time.